My name is Ruthie Erdman, and I'm pleased to teach you. Welcome, 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 listeners. This week I have a real treat for you. I'm interviewing Mrs. Ruthie Erdman. Uh, here on campus, she teaches women and gender studies, uh, 16th century to 19th century culture and art, and a few other classes. She's been here for a very long time, and uh, she has many great followers, students all around the world now. Uh, I may or may not expand this podcast to anyone's personal story. So yeah, I look forward to seeing you all in season two. But until then, I give you listeners, Ruthie Erdman. So Ruthie, where haven't you been? Oh, where where have you been? I'm sorry to say I have not yet been to Asia or Africa, which is a shame because I really think uh, some of the best cuisines are there, and I'd like to go on food tours Mm -hmm. of Asia and Africa. But in fact, I've been only to Europe, Um, four countries. I've been to England three times, Italy once, and France and Germany each once. So are these vacations, or did you have business Sort there? of. My daughter did study abroad in Italy, and so I visited her for a, a couple of weeks while she was living in Florence uh, doing study abroad. And I actually made a point of visiting art museums because I teach art history. I teach the Italian Renaissance. So I, I went to the Uffizi Gallery, one of the best Renaissance art uh, galleries in the world. That was really cool because I was seeing things at last that I had taught for like 15 years. And suddenly it's like, oh, now I can see it. It was amazing. And I went to the Galleria Academia and I went to the Vatican Museums and I'm, I think that was it for Italy. But uh, yeah, so a lot of my travels, I try to make sure I do museums. Fortunately, I'm usually with people who also want to see museums. So my first trip was to England and that was my colleague and best friend of 25 years, Dr. Harper, got a paper accepted there at the University of Birmingham. So she was going to go there to present her paper and I said, I'm coming with you. I don't care what you say. I'm coming with you. I'll shine your shoes. I'll carry your suitcase, but I'm coming with you. And I did. (laughs) Well, she's my best friend, so that worked. And then actually she camped out at the site of the conference four days ahead of the conference preparing because she had a paper to deliver. Well, I didn't. So I just took off on my own and stayed in hostels that I had booked ahead. And by the way, that's a lovely way to travel. It's cheap. Um, the, I mean, the Youth Hosteling International, and I'm not a youth, but I still did it, <laughs> and uh, uh, stayed in hostels in villages. I was off the tourist grid. I was in areas where uh, I was the only American. Uh, the, everybody was British, so that was cool, and lucky they all spoke English. <laughs> so then uh, third trip uh, was to England again. That time, my best friend got a paper accepted at the University of Cambridge. So I got to go to Cambridge, and she had to present the paper, not me. <laughs> that would have scared me. Uh, But then uh, she had to come home, and I stayed on. So I was alone in a foreign country. But England isn't very foreign. Everybody speaks English. It's kind of the mother culture uh, for American culture. And so I I went to Oxford, too, because I wanted to see Oxford. I got to stay in a dorm. You can stay in a dorm at Cambridge or Oxford for a low fee uh, during the summer when the dorms are empty. Uh, And then the fourth trip was uh, with my son. And that time, man, I really hit the museums. Uh, So we started in Germany just because it was cheaper to fly there. And I went to the Stadel Museum in uh, Frankfurt, I think that was. And then uh, we went to... Paris and I went to the Louvre. Wow, don't do the Louvre unless you've got really good shoes and a lot of stamina and you've got all day. And that's what we did. But wow, did I see a lot of art that I'd talked about and never seen. Uh, And then we went to uh, London and I went to uh, the National Gallery, which is art, of course, and then the British Museum, which is artifacts. And oh, my word. Well, just museums, lots and lots. So you can get an education. So I I recommend students study abroad. I did not get overseas until I was 44. Don't do that. You have a great opportunity right here at Central to get overseas before you're 44. I say do it. It's an education in itself. Nice. Okay. (laughs) So where did you pick up your love for music? I was raised in a musical family at age. Five. I'm one of four siblings, and my well, there were supposed to be two. I was one of the surprises. But anyway, uh, at age five, they started each of us on keyboard to teach us just the fundamentals of music, mm-hmm. and then we were each supposed to choose our instrument. Uh, my sister chose flute. I chose clarinet. My younger brother 
dropped the ball somehow. I'm not sure how that happened. He got out of ever having an instrument. But anyway, my older brother tried clarinet, tried violin, and came back to piano. And he became actually the, one of the two best amateur pianists in the state of Oregon. And he came here for a music degree. He came to Central. He didn't want to be a concert pianist, which was, he was good enough to be that, but he didn't want to travel like that. Came to Central and got a degree in music education, so, and my sister is still heavily involved in music, so I did not. My degrees are in religious studies and uh, English literature, uh, but I did become a pretty accomplished clarinetist. That's long gone. <laughs> I still uh, sometimes just play keyboard. I'm not a keyboardist, but you know I learned the fundamentals that way, and I'm still a vocalist, so I'm, I'm a member of a little a cappella group called Silver and Black that just performs at local wow, venues. Cool. Yeah. So just uh, the, I used to play uh, string bass as well. I played that in orchestras, the one that you stand next to. Mm -hmm. And I also played tenor sax in a jazz band. So I was heavily, heavily into music and theater when I was in middle school and high school. But now it's just the a cappella singing. That's really funny. What's your funny. favorite play? What's your favorite musical? Oh, my word. Oh, my favorite. I'll, I'll probably Les Mis. When we were in London, my son insisted that, by gum, we were going to go to a West End musical. That was for me. <laughs> and uh, because I love Les Miserables, uh, that's the one we went to an ow, my word. Though I talk about being blown out of the water. The West End production of Les Mis is the longest running production on the West End. It wow. is, yeah, and it's it's absolutely astounding. Uh, and so it's better maybe to see that there even than to see it on Broadway. So that was wow. absolutely amazing. What was your other question? Uh, musical. That was the musical, Les Miserables. Okay, uh, then normal play with less music. Oh, play. Oh, boy, that would be hard to say. There are so many plays that I love. Uh, of course, there's all the Shakespeare plays. Oh, my goodness. Um, you're going to have to let me think about that one. Yeah, I, yeah, see, we might well, have to come are. back to <laughs> uh, When I was 10, uh, I got to visit my uncle in New York, and I got to see Billy Elliot uh, off Broadway. Wow. But I didn't... Ah! Okay. I didn't know many swear words, oh. and okay. half the dialogue of Billy Elliot was swear words. Oh, so wow. I didn't actually understand what was going on until you much later. I feel that if there's, every third word is a swear word, that's like lazy writing. Like, I like to yeah. swear, but you don't have to like put that every third word. Like, what, yeah. what's the matter with your vocabulary that you have to keep going back to that? But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> don't put that on the air. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I really do like musicals. Uh, musicals are okay, yeah. a favorite of mine. Um, um, yes, I've been to a lot of plays here at Central. Central put on a wonderful production years ago, like 15 years ago, of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. It must have been 15 I, or 20 years ago. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. In McConnell. Nice. Well, of course, all the Shakespeare's. Um, but I, like, I actually like the comedies. Uh, the tragedies, they're, you know, they're, they're deeper, but oh my yeah. word, how depressing. So yeah. I actually teach the comedies. When I teach a Shakespeare play, it's oh, a comedy, wow. just That's because awesome. everybody gets the tragedies, you know, in, yeah. in high school. And as they I think Shakespeare's all about, you know, people dying. So I have, yeah, to, right? have to throw in yeah. a comedy to show them he had more range yeah. than that. He didn't have every play with dead people on the stage at the end. Yeah. So, so even though I, I got Shakespeare education, I didn't really get into the good stuff. Like eighth grade, we did Romeo and Juliet. Tragedy. High school, we did Macbeth. I didn't like Tragedy. it. And we saw, like, the, the underground, like, gritty, like, mm -hmm. weird, futuristic version of it. it oh, yeah. It, it didn't work. But then I did Theater 101 here, and we did Tempest. Mm. We watched it. Did you do the one with Helen Mirren as Prospero? I couldn't tell you. I kind know. of the wizard person? Was that a woman? Oh, well, anyway. Uh, I used to teach Theater 101. I taught it for two years. Yeah. I couldn't tell you who the characters were. Uh, There's also Christopher was, Walken. That's another one. Or Plummer. I always get my Christophers confused. Anyway. Yeah, I get my I get Robin Williams and Robert Downey Jr. mixed. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Right. they're I very different, but yeah, they're both the same amount of method acting. But but I love Tempest. Uh, we also watched. Um, we did that here. A few Good years ago. Kids and Great Expectations. I get those two mixed up. One of them is like super local, and the other one is Great Expectations yeah. is uh, Dickens. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, we saw we saw like the super goth version of it. It was wonderful. It just delivered cool. well. I just I would watch it again if I could. Can you tell me about the Midsummer Night's Dream? Like, what's the plot? Like, oh, it's a very it's kind of a strange plot. There, they weren't people did not go out at night in Shakespeare's day. The streets were not lit, and you certainly didn't go wandering off into the forest at night. So a large part of it is imagining what goes on in the forest at night. Okay. And so there are fairies out there. There are divine, supernatural beings. And they are messing with humans who manage to somehow wander into the forest at night. What they're doing is a, a young woman is running away because she's being forced to marry a man she doesn't want to marry. The man she wants to marry also runs away. The man she's supposed to marry also runs away. <laughs> I 
like chasing after her, actually. And then <laughs> another woman who's in love with a man she's supposed to marry and doesn't want to marry. So it's these two very tangled couples are out there in the forest, and the uh, fairies and divine beings start messing with them. It's very funny. They drop magical juice in the eyes of actually of one of the fairies, the fairy queen, so that she falls in love with a donkey. And yeah, it's, just, it's a lot of romping and frolicking, but it's also exploring issues of um, restriction and autonomy. You know, like how free oh, okay. should you be? Because the forest represents that freedom. You run away from where you are being repressed and told what to do, and you run into the forest. It's called the green world. It's got this whole literary concept of if you can get away into the green world, then things open up. You know, things can be different. And so through a series of ridiculous and funny situations, uh, it, it gets resolved, and they end up with the right partners. But there's magic, and there's... Yeah. Uh, yes. It's wonderful. It's fun. It's a fun one to put on because of all the special effects. You have to have special effects. Yeah. So when Central put it on in McConnell, they had a trap door, and the fairy king would come rising up out of the trap door. Wow. So, it, yeah, it's very fun. They come floating down from somewhere, you know. So, yeah, That's a cool. lot of magic. And now to the education part. Of the classes you like to teach, what are the lessons you like look forward to when teaching? I love doing lectures on – I do one on, on several classes. I have different variants of this on Columbus and the European expansion, because the version of that that we get in grade school is, and then Columbus came, and then everybody lived happily ever after. <laughs> and it's not like that at all. I give the reality of what that was like for the natives of nice. the New World. And not only that, not Columbus, but then for the centuries after that, like what has happened to them, how decimated they were, yeah. and that, that perspective that's so repressed. A lot of my teaching is about bringing forward repressed, submerged perspectives. And so that's a big one. What was the European in, um, expansion invasion like uh, for the native peoples of the New World? And of course, it was a freaking disaster. And then, of course, the slaves. There's another one I do want on slavery, actually. But then when the New World was discovered, that's what ramped up slavery. Oh, look yeah. at all this land. Let's farm it, but we don't want to do the work. Let's get somebody else to do it. So uh, this whole idea that and, and America is a great country and I love being an American and I love American principles, but we can't pretend that there is no ugly underside to our history. You know, and I have to bring that in. What happened to the Native Americans here and what happened to the slaves here as well as in, you know, the rest of the New World. So mm -hmm. bringing forward those uh, repressed, submerged perspectives is a huge part of my passion. That's a big responsibility, mm -hmm. too. Make sure nothing repeats. Or Oh, that's the point. We do tend to repeat uh, the history we do not study. That's true. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I can't think of much else. Well, uh, just that um, in all my classes, too, I just try to bring forth uh, perspectives that I think are going to relate to students in the class who may be themselves members of repressed groups, uh, oppressed groups, submerged groups. So it's not just uh, African Americans, Native Americans, you know, racial minorities. I talk about women's issues a lot. Oh, yeah. Because women, women and yeah, I, I teach in the Women's and Gender Studies and Sexuality Studies program because, of course, as a woman, I've always been aware of how women tend to get marginalized and our history and contributions tend to disappear. But the biggest eye opener for me in the last 10 or 15 years has been uh, the LGBT contributions to civilization because I, I mm -hmm. mostly teach Western civilization and when you look into that like okay what's the, what you know what's the women's contribution it's much bigger than you realize and then you look into what's the LGBTQ contribution it's immense and so and, and yet we pick on people for being whatever isn't the majority yeah. you yes. know and so there's this tendency to uh, marginalize certain groups and women are the only one that's in, that are not a numerical minority the others yeah. tend to be a numerical minority women are not but the lgbtq are and they get picked on just like every other minority and it's a shame because wow the talent and the artistry yeah. that they have brought to our world is is absolutely mind-blowing yeah. yeah progression so that's an important part of my teaching is to try to stop that, that tendency to write off certain groups as, oh, we're, we're good, but you're useless, you know, <laughs> we don't need you. In fact, we wish you would disappear. It's like, no, nobody, nobody's in that category. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, folks. That's all for this week. Uh, I'll have one more episode next week, and then I'll see you uh, by the beginning of next school year. The cover art of this podcast is by Catherine Guevara. You can reach me at um, pleased to teach you at yahoo.com. And if you or someone you know really likes the stories of teachers, share this podcast. Thank you and have a wonderful week. <laughs>